Hi folks, welcome to this video on biomechanics technology. Now apologies, I've gone for a bit of information overkill on these screens, but what I'll do is I'll try and attempt to highlight, underline the key bits of information that you need regarding technology yeah. from a biomechanics point of view. There are three types of biomechanics technology that they can ask you about on the exam paper. One of those is called limb kinematics, okay? Now you've got an example of limb kinematics in this picture over here. As you can see, what they've done is they've, stick, they've stuck tiny little white dots on all key aspects of the joints of this person. And what happens is cameras can then map the images of these, uh, where the locations of these dots, sorry, and create a, essentially a computer framework of the individual. Now, why would you want to do that? That would allow you to look at the performance technique in real high, high levels of detail. You look at the exact angles that they're creating uh, and whether they are the correct angles or the incorrect angles when somebody's doing a set technique. Now, when you're working with elite athletes, those, you know, being one or two degrees out is absolutely massive. So if you can highlight to a performer and then work on it and improve their joint angles, it makes them more efficient. Equally, it can show you whether your performer is at injury risk. If they're forever using the wrong technique and they're getting their angles wrong when the when the performing a set move then again that can highlight uh, an increased injury risk so again if you can iron out those creases in terms of their performance you minimize the amount of time they have to spend out due to an injury so the key bits we need to know we use body markers and we use multiple cameras from different angles and that allows us to map the body in terms of what it's doing if you've ever played fifa these computer games they use the same technology to recruit the players, your professional footballers wear these body markers and they kick balls and head balls and tackle in a, in a lab and they use the same technology to map the player's movement so you can then recreate it in a computer game. So it, it, it spawned out into, into the gaming world, this kind of technology. And um, what it does is it creates a then 3D image of the performer executing the movement. So the key thing is we use body markers, multiple camera angles, uh, uh, multiple cameras at different angles, sorry, and it creates a 3D image of the performer. And we can do that for analysis of the full movement or of specific limbs. And that is all there really is to say about um, limb kinematics. Um, just a couple of other key bits that, you know, the success of this technology is dependent on the accuracy of these placements. You've got to get them bang on. These, these haven't just been stuck on randomly. They've been stuck on all major bony landmarks in the body. So, um, you know, the, the, the base of the, well, just above the base of the femur there, the top of the tibia goes on there, uh, just the outside of the fibula down there. So you've got to make sure you stick them on exactly where you want them to be. Uh, otherwise, the, the, the data that you're going to get, the angles that you're going to get are going to be out and it's going to be absolutely pointless. Also, is lab-based. So you've got to ask yourself, how sport specific is this? What you're doing is you're getting someone to practice kicking, jumping, twisting, turning, tackling, etc. in a lab with cameras mounted around the walls or around to give the 3D analysis. Well, they're not doing it on court or on track or on the pitch. So again, it lacks a little bit of validity straight away. And it's also very, very expensive. But the data that you get can be very, very useful, particularly when you're working with elite level performers. So the second uh, piece of biomechanical technology that you need to know about, something called force plates. Now, again, come from information overkill, but you can pause this screen. You can read through it at your own leisure. Now, as it says here, this piece of technology is usually a metal plate sunk into the ground. However, if you look at the Liverpool players train at the bottom, these metal plates have not been sunk into the ground. If you look at the golfers here, these force plates have not been sunk into the ground either. So you can get more portable uh, force plates these days that you can move around. Now, what you do is you connect these force plates, or these force plates are connected uh, to specialist computer software. Now, what you do with the force plate is you do whatever spot action you want to analyze. So, for example, these Liverpool players here are jumping on a force plate and landing on a force plate. This golfer here, these force plates, she's, she's going to drive uh, the golf ball. And these force plates are going to measure the actions and the forces going through the feet as she rotates. So you can land on force plates, jump on force plates, run on force plates, twists on them. Um, and it allows you and the computer software as well.
to measure the forces that are going through the feet and therefore the forces going through the force plate. So you think back to the work on biomechanics when you've been looking at things like reaction forces and, and weight and things like that. These force plates can really start to tell you the forces acting through the performer. Now the forces that these force plates measure are summed up on this diagram uh, here. So what you've got is you've got an FZ force. An FZ force measures the forces going vertically up and down. So when these Liverpool players land on this force plate, boom, they're going to get a very big FZ force. But equally, when these Liverpool players push down on the force plate to drive upwards, again, you're going to get a good FZ force or high FZ force. So force plates can measure forces going up and down. The FY forces go either way front to, uh, front to back on these force plates. So they measure things like accelerating and decelerating forces. So imagine that someone is running and they are running in this direction, okay? And their foot lands on the force plate, okay? As their foot lands down on the force plate and then pushes off on the force plate, you'll get an FZ force as they land on it and push off. But you'll also get an FY force the foot landing on the force plate and acting as a bit of a break, and then the foot driving on the force plate to push you forwards. So I can get vertical forces, I can get front to back forces. The final ones here, your FX forces, and these measure side to side movements, so any rocking or rotational movements that take place. If we look at this golfer here, as she drives this golf ball, she's going to get a lot of FX forces as her feet rotate on the force uh, plate. So you can really get a good idea of all the different forces and all the different angles that those forces are acting at through your feet when you are doing a certain sports action. So to get a bit of the, highlight a bit of the text here, uh, the computer can show the size of the force, the direction of the force, the time the force was applied for, and again in three different directions, vertically, forwards and backwards, right, and side to side. Uh, which is really, really important. Um, we can use it to identify, therefore, where forces need to be increased, decreased, or removed altogether. So a lot of your trainer manufacturers, Nike, Adidas, all, all those major companies, use force plates to measure how good their, their trainers are, the soles of the shoes, are absorbing impacts, minimising impacts, maximising the forces that are being produced, etc., etc. So again, these can be used to analyse performance, improve technique, but also to help try and minimise injuries that might take place. You know, if there's too much force going through a certain joint, this allows us to identify that and do something about it. Now, again, what, where's the similarities between force plates and limb kinematics? The big similarity is data. This, this provides data as well. It can show you the size of forces, the angle of forces, the... Uh, the time that the force was applied for, etc., etc. So it can really give you data, and data doesn't lie. It's fact. It, it, it's evidence that this is taking place in the body, or this isn't taking place in the body. So again, it's really, really good. It can improve technique, as we've just said. It can minimise injury risk again. However, it's very expensive. It's specialist equipment as well. And again, we need to use it in labs. So straight away, it's lacking a bit of sports specificity because. It's not exactly how they're going to be doing it on the actual pitch, court track, whatever it is that they're doing, because you need to have access to a force plate that's hooked up to a computer. So again, there's a couple of downsides to it as well. Now, the final piece of biomechanics technology you need to know about is one that hopefully you've seen you know, on, on TV a couple of times. Uh, wind tunnels. Okay. Now, wind tunnels uh, allow you to see the flow of air. If we look at this picture of the ski at the bottom, the flow of air around an object. So what you've got here is, you've actually got a huge fan behind the person. And what this fan does is, it creates a vacuum, so it sucks air this way. So the air is flowing in that direction there, okay? The performer gets into various body positions, and then you get someone in the lab to create like a jet of steam to go over and around them, and you can then see the airflow going over and around the performer. And it allows you to see how smooth that airflow is. If, this, if the airflow is very turbulent, i.e. not very smooth, then this person isn't in a very streamlined position. If the airflow is very smooth as it is around here, as you can see in this um, here, then you can see that this performer is in a very streamlined position. 
and that means that they're going to minimize air resistance and maximize their speed. Now, some examples, you know, Formula One is very big on using wind tunnels, cycling, as you can see from the picture at the bottom. Air resistance is often referred to as drag. So anything that can help you reduce drag is going to maximize your performance on the track, on, uh, on the circuit, whatever it is that your sport is, on, on the ski slope as it is with the skier. Um, but, you know, other applications where it is getting used, uh, coming away from some of these as well, you know, you're looking at bike helmets. Um, if you look at the picture of the cyclist that you've got here, you've got this, the smoke going over and around. So this is looking at the helmet design and making sure that there's a nice, smooth airflow going along the back of the cyclist. If it's not, if it's turbulent, that's more air resistance the cyclist is going to encounter, the slower their speed is going to be. So there's lots of sports that can actually benefit uh, from using wind tunnels. Now, one of the big advantages of wind tunnels is that you can control the strength of the wind, the direction of the wind. You can't do that when you're outside. So you can actually mimic whatever condition you want in terms of wind in the wind tunnel. Um, and it allows you to measure air resistance and see if your drag reduction systems are working properly, i.e. your strategies to minimize air resistance, if they're working. However, surprise, surprise, this equipment is unbelievably expensive and a wind tunnel is an absolutely huge piece of technology. You need something like an aircraft hangar to, to put one in for a, a Formula One car, for example. So again, the, the, the issue is uh, the cost of it. Also, as you can see here, you can't actually move in a wind tunnel. This cyclist is not cycling. The skier is not skiing. When the Formula One car is in the wind tunnel, it is just parked. So again, it, it does lack a little bit of sport specificity because the object is remaining still in the wind tunnel. Now, that's not the way it works when you get to the actual sport setting. Now, the big thing about this topic is you need to know what each kind of technology is and effectively how it works. I've also tried to give you some examples because obviously they're good AO2 points, examples of who might use this kind of technology. But it's worth checking that, checking that you can give a couple of examples on who would use each kind of technology. The final thing is you might be asked to evaluate this kind of technology. We've done some evaluation as we've gone through, but just to kind of bring it all together, all three of these types of technology, they all provide data. Now, this is a big, big benefit. Remember, data generally doesn't lie. Subjective assessment is someone's opinion. So I think you look faster. I think it looks more streamlined. I think you're producing more force there. Yeah, but you've got no proof that you are, okay? Whereas all of these types of technology, limb kinematics, force plates, and wind tunnels provide us with data so we know whether this thing is actually working or not, whether the forces are too low or too high or just right, whether we're streamlining just right. So it gives us data. As a result, all three uh, aspects of uh, technology help us improve technique. They make sure we're getting the right technique and we're using it correctly. And as a result, that can help us minimize our risk of injury. So all three of these technologies can, can have very, very similar benefits to each other, just go about it in different ways. In terms of the negatives then, all three of these are very, very expensive. So the cost uh, is, is, is an obvious downside. This technology all requires frequent calibration to make sure it's working effectively. To calibrate means to check that it's doing exactly what it should do, to make sure it's measuring the forces correctly. It's going to need well-trained personnel to use it effectively. So it's not only the cost, it's the calibration and the, the personnel to use it properly. And as we've mentioned throughout this video, it's lab-based technology. Every single piece that we've spoken about takes place in some, some kind of lab setting. It doesn't take place out on court, out on track, out on the pitch. So it, it lacks a little bit of validity straight away because we're not doing it in the natural sporting environment. Okay? So there are your evaluation points around technology uh, to do with biomechanics. Hope you found this video useful, folks.